Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 53 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, uh, and Left Side of the Aisle this week is for the week of April 9th, uh, 19th to 25th, 2012. Uh, and um, about the next half hour or so, I'm going to be ranting at you and telling stories and whatnot and talking about things that um, I think you should know about and that are worthy of your attention. Uh, any comments, questions, reactions, plaudits, brickbats, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, and you probably didn't, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and um, you can get the email address from there. I do answer my email. I am a little slow about it sometimes, but I do answer it. Uh, but I have one request, which is that if you email me to include something like your, you know, your, your, your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that in the subject line so that I know it's not spam, as I almost have on at least one occasion. Um, I'm going to start this week, uh, as I like to start, with a um, couple of bits of good news. I always like to start with good news. First bit of good news is that the Connecticut legislature has passed a bill to end the death penalty in that state. Governor Donald Malloy says he will sign that bill as soon as it reaches his desk, which will probably be next week. This will make Connecticut the 17th state in the country and the fifth state in the last five years to eliminate use of the death penalty. And personally, I am delighted that this this symbol of savagery, this badge of brutality, is, um, is not being used. Um, I got involved in politics at a time when law and order, or law and order if you prefer, uh, was actually the cry of the day, the hue and cry, and death penalty opponents seemed to be facing an unstoppable wave of frium sweeping, sweeping across the nation. So I'm glad to see, very glad to see, that this, uh, this tide appears now to be flowing in the opposite direction. On the other hand, I'm old enough, um, though I wasn't really aware of it at the time, but I do remember the case of Carol Chessman. Uh, if you don't know this, you should look it up. It's an almost completely forgotten case now, but it's a really fascinating case about the death penalty. You should look it up. Uh, it's Carol Chessman, and it's spelled C-A-R-Y-L. Chessman, just the way it sounds, C-H-E-S-S-M-A-N. -E -S -S so look that up. The other bit of good news I've got is that ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, this is a group that exists to bring together right-wing corporations and right-wing lobbyists with right-wing state legislatures to, legislators rather, to push right-wing laws through, uh, through at the state level. Uh, well, recently it's lost a number of its corporate sponsors as the result of a campaign waged by colorofchange.org and a number of other progressive groups. Um, and as a result of that, ALEC has announced that it is going to shut down its Task Force on Public Safety and Elections. This is the task force that has pulled things like the now notorious stand your ground laws and the restrictive voter ID laws in various states, and they're shutting that down. Um, that's actually good news. And beyond that, what's also been good, in fact, it has been hilarious to watch the uh, right wing um, sputter, fume, and froth about the fascist tactics. Now, it was actually the term was used, fascist tactics of this campaign, the tactics of, tactics of which consisted of uh, saying to those corporations, we're going to tell your customers where their money is going fascism. Okay, moving on from there. I said last week that I was going to be talking some more about bigotry, um, especially as revealed in the cases of Trayvon Martin and the reaction to a recent bit of slime spewed out by this right-wing jackass, but I repeat myself, uh, this right-wing jackass, uh, John Derbyshire, and, and again, to, to point out here, I'm not going to be so much talking about the case themselves or the article itself as the reactions to it. Okay? But first, I have to correct myself on something. When I first talked about the Trayvon Martin case, one of the things I said was uh, that I wanted you to imagine what would have happened if everything had been identical except the colors of their skin had been reversed. 
And I said, you know the answer to that question. It appears I was wrong. According to a USA Today Gallup poll, only 33% of non-Hispanic whites think that George Zimmerman would have been arrested had Trayvon Martin been white. Fully half of those polled, half, half of non-Hispanic whites said it would have made no difference at all. Now, admittedly, this question only asked about if Trayvon Martin had been white, not if, in addition, George Zimmerman had been black. But, I mean, I still have to ask, what country have you people been living in for the last 50 years? Have you really learned nothing in that time? And the truth is, maybe you haven't. This guy, Roy Adroso, he writes a column for the Village Voice about the right-wing blogosphere. Um, and by the way, I'm indebted to him for a number of the quotes that I'm going to use here. Uh, he wrote recently that, I'm quoting him, one of the enduring myths of American conservatism is that there's still racism in this country and it's suffered by white people at the hands of blacks and white liberal race traitors. Now, if you think he's exaggerating, American Thinker, this is one of the top right-wing blogs in terms of traffic. American Thinker said recently, quote, the truth of the matter is that civil rights cases are often little more than reverse lynch mobs. And in that same post added, certainly it's true that in the past blacks have been victims of whites, but today the reality is quite different. In fact, in the response to Trayvon Martin, the right wing did everything it could to minimize and, you'll pardon the expression, whitewash what actually went down. For example, a lot was made of the fact that George Zimmerman looks Hispanic, as if that's supposed to make a difference for who knows what reason. Now, Zimmerman is actually half Hispanic. His mother is white and his father is Hispanic. But even before that was confirmed, it was just, he looks Hispanic. Now, how is that supposed to prove that there was no racism involved here? I, I, it gets weirder than that. Dan Reel, he's another top-line right-wing blogger, he recently whined about the race-based ignorance of blacks who criticized him because he tried to smear Trayvon Martin. He said they should be criticizing the media. He wasn't clear about for what. Right, it gets weirder still. Neil Bortz, this is a well-known name. Neil Bortz agreed that Trayvon Martin probably would not have been killed were it not for the color of his skin. He said that he figured that George Zimmerman just saw a young black male in his neighborhood at night and just assumed that he had to be some kind of criminal. And then he went on to say that the real problem here, however, is not the shooting. It's that, quoting him, the entire situation is now being used by various race pimps to grab a little publicity while agitating the crowd. And we all know how dangerous it is to rile up them black folk. It also got more vicious uh, power line. This is, one again, one of the top trafficked right-wing blogs. Powerline resorted to the black murder rate meme. Although what that has to do with the murder of an unarmed black teenager again, not surprisingly, goes unexplained. Meanwhile, there's a captain in the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department who posted on Facebook that he could rewrite the book on our urban youth. I wonder who he meant by that. Uh, that he could rewrite the book on our urban youth who were, quoting him, products of their failed dirt bag, except he didn't say dirt bag, he used another four-letter word ending in T, which I can't say here, Products of their failed, dirtbag, ignorant, pathetic, welfare-dependent excuses for parents. Of course. <laughs> no, no racism there, is there? Sometime back, I think it was actually about August or so, I talked about my rules for right-wing debate. That is, how right-wingers debate. One of the rules was, when facts are undeniable, change the subject. Another was, be sure to denounce the left in the form of what about fill in the blank, being sure whenever possible to use the words hypocrite and or hypocrisy. Well, this whole business has been chock-a-block full, full of examples of both those rules. 
Uh, for example, there was uh, numerous examples of the classic right-wing attempt to change the subject. In fact, redstate.com, another top-line right-wing blog, demanded to know why everyone wasn't focusing on the real important issue here, which is, according to them, incursions into the U.S. by Mexican drug cartels. Comments on blogs, these blogs and others were full of comments uh, with refutations of charges of racism, a lot of which ran along the lines of things like, what about Marion Barry? Or it had a link to some newspaper article about some crime committed by some black person somewhere. And, you know, I've already mentioned Dan Reel's, like, sniffling about, the media is just weird, mean to us. <laughs> yeah, well, he wasn't the only one sniffling. Uh... Wayne Il Duce Lapierre, the executive vice president of the National Rifle Association, uh, he said it's all the media's fault for reporting the story. He said the media is ignoring crimes uh, against everyday citizens, he said. Everyday citizens aren't celebrities. They don't draw ratings. They don't draw sponsors. But sensational reporting from Florida does. Now, in addition to the fact that I was unaware until that very moment that Trayvon Martin was a celebrity, um, the thing is, if Il Duce, uh, Il Duce is right, not all crime things make the national news. In fact, here's one. In February 2005, four white Chicago cops stopped a black man named Howard Morgan for going the wrong way in a one-way street. Morgan was an off-duty cop. He was working as a detective for the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Now, the cops claimed that for some never explained reason, uh, Morgan, outnumbered four to one, suddenly started opening fire with his service weapon when the cops tried to arrest him. They responded by shooting him 28 times. Now, amazingly, he survived and was charged with attempted murder of the cops. In his first trial, he was acquitted on three charges, including a charge of firing his gun, but the jury deadlocked on a charge of attempted murder, which strikes me as frankly really odd because how can you say he might be guilty of attempted murder when you've already agreed he didn't fire his gun? But never mind. They deadlocked on those charges, so he was retried on those charges in uh, 2011. Now consider this. Not only are we supposed to accept the idea that an individual black man alone, for reasons never explained, suddenly starts trying to open fire on four cops, but after he was arrested, his van was crushed and destroyed without notice, without cause, and without any forensic examination. Morgan was never tested for gunpowder residue to see if he'd actually fired his gun, and at trial, one cop claimed that Morgan shot him and it hit his bulletproof vest. But the state and the prosecution never produced that vest. They produced a replica of the vest. Despite this, in January, Morgan was convicted of four counts of attempted murder. On April 9th, he was sentenced to 40 years in prison, which is essentially a life sentence since Morgan is 61 years old. Okay, there is a crime case that has not made the national news. But, frankly, I doubt that's the kind of case that our gun nut Pepe Le Pew was thinking of when, uh, when he raised the issue. And we still have John Derbyshire to look at. Now, just a quick reminder of what this is. He wrote a column... Uh, not long ago. He's, he's a, he was with the, a writer with the National Review, but in a different magazine. He wrote a column about the talk that he would have with his children about dealing with black people. The advice included things like avoid groups of blacks, avoid black neighborhoods. If you're at a public event and the number of blacks increases, leave. Don't live in a city with a black mayor. Don't act the good Samaritan to blacks in apparent distress. And he also said that the average black is much less intelligent than the average white. Now, one of those funny things, he had like links to supposedly back up his various claims he made about black people, um, and apparently trusting in the axiom that people generally don't follow those links. If you did, you discovered that in most cases, the links did not say what he claimed they said, except for one, 
which was a link to a site run by a avowed racist and white nationalist. Well, this was too much even for the National Review. They fired him. And the right-wing blogs, a number of them flipped out. How dare they fire him? What cowards they are. He's a martyr to truth. One such blogger referred to the piece as honest and brave and called his firing a matter of that all-purpose right-wing bumper sticker political correctness. Because, as Roy Adroso remarked, this guy couldn't manage to find anything racist about the idea that white people should avoid contact with black people because if they don't get, they'll get killed. Uh, another goes by the name of Vox Day, uh, called the bucket of raw sewage that uh, Derbyshire spilled all over, sloshed all over the internet. A profile in intellectual courage and ranted about how disgusting it was that some right-wingers, some right-wingers actually distanced themselves from his overt racism. Uh, he referred to racial equality as a failed myth and said we actually need to start a government program of resegregation because if we don't, we're going to face the increasing level of violence quoted that will, be, that will eventually be required to recreate the historic balances that were originally brought about by the natural processes of group behavior. I really expected to see in there some, lo some noble exclamation of the white man's burden, except that I think this guy might have thought that position was too liberal. Now, I need, to, I need to make something clear here. There's something to be understood here. I'm not talking here about the, the undercurrent of racism that goes through our society, that ripples through our society. The undercurrent of racism that stains our political spectrum from the right to the left and back again. I'm not talking about the casual racism, the ignorant racism. I'm not talking about the racism expressed uh, in the offhand remark that you make without thinking about what it is you're actually saying. Um, the remark that you don't realize how hurtful it is until somebody points it out to you. That's the kind of racism that embarrasses you, that upsets you, that you try to get rid of in yourself once you're made, your, uh, made aware that it's there. I'm, I'm not, that's an important issue, that kind of you know, un, unexamined racism. But I'm not talking about that here. It's an important issue. I, I need to talk about it at some point, but I'm, that's what I'm talking about here. I'm talking here about these people are not ignorant. They are not casual about their racism. They are racist to their very marrow. They don't want to eliminate racism. They embrace it. They endorse it as, as, as if it were, in fact, they regard it as some kind of revealed truth. We have to realize that when in dealing with a significant part of the American right wing, we are not dealing with rational people. All right, from there, I'm going to switch to uh, the Outrage of the Week, our regular feature. Um, this is going to be a little bit more lighthearted Outrage of the Week. It's not so much outrageous as it is utterly, utterly ridiculously inane. We're going to start with Representative Alan West, a Republican from Looney Tunes. He told constituents at a recent town hall event that he's heard that about 80 members of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives are members of the Communist Party. Turns out the people he was talking about were the members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And his office released a statement, his West office released a statement saying, the Communist Party has publicly referred to the Progressive Caucus as its allies. Well, the best response to that actually came from the Communist Party, which said that, well, yeah, we agree with them on a lot of things, but that hardly makes them commies. In fact, the party said, we believe in public parks. We assume Alan West does too. By his logic, that makes him a communist, which is a great response, except I'm not sure Alan West actually does believe in public parks. New moving on then, the next example, Newt Grinch. He was speaking at the NRA convention last week, and he told those assembled that they had been too timid. He told the NRA that they had been too timid in promoting gun rights. He says the U.S. should push the, push the United Nations for an international treaty that allowed everybody in the world to carry guns. Now, 
Leaving aside the notion of Newt Grinch and the NRA pushing for UN action, the best response to that came from Cenk Uger, who said, we've tried that. It's called Somalia. And finally, on our, on our troika of triviality, we have Senator James Roxanne said Inhoff. Now, this one's a bit old, but it does fit in here. Not long ago, he was on a Christian radio station, and during that interview, he argued against the idea of human-caused climate change on the grounds that God's still up there. He cited Genesis 8.22 in the King James Version that reads, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Now, since no one is saying that as the result of global warming, that day and night or summer and winter will cease, but only that the planet will be a lot less comfortable place to live on for a heck of a lot of us, um, I, I can't imagine how that advances his argument. I mean, you know, how does that passage even say that the climate can't be changed? Unless... Inhofe is saying that the climate can't change, period. In which case, I wonder if he also doesn't believe in ice ages. By the way, he also cited Romans 125 to say that people who accept the scientific reality of global climate change are worshiping the creation instead of the creator. These people are idiots. And they are collectively the outrage of the week. And one quick thing, that uh, Inhofe statement brings us to something about global warming. The last time I was talking about global warming, I noted that there was one week in March when about a thousand places in North America uh, had record heat. Um, turns out I was a little bit off. For the entire month of March in North America, there were over 15,000 local heat records broken. It was the warmest March in U.S. recorded history, which dates back 115 years. Now, this does not prove global warming, okay? It doesn't. I've always said one hot spell no more proves global warming than one cold spell disproves it. Global warming is about the trend over the years, not the variation in short-term uh, short weather. But it is one more data point in a mountain and a growing mountain of data points. The best remark on this was made by a man named Gabriel Vecchi. He's a climate scientist at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He compared it to a baseball player on steroids. He said, you can't say that any given home run is the result of that player using steroids. You can say the fact that he hit 25 more this year than he did the year before does. And that is simply the reality of global warming. We're going to take a break. Hi, and we're back. Uh, I mentioned at the top of the show that this is episode 53 of Left Side of the Aisle. We've been here, done 53 shows in 53 weeks. So having completed the 52nd week, starting on our 53rd, this, in fact, is the first anniversary show of Left Side of the Aisle. So happy anniversary to me. So for the rest of the show... I, it's going to be, you know, a little, little more laid back. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is repeat the, um, uh, uh, the introduction I gave to myself about myself in the very first show, about my little bit of my background and whatnot. So you can put what you hear in context. I said, I am in many ways a child of the 60s. I came to uh, political awareness during that brief and somewhat have it mythological time that was marked at one end by the Sgt. Pepper Summer and the other by Altamont, or if you prefer a political description, by Flower Power and the Days of Rage. Like most members of my generation, well, all right, I have to amend that, most, at least male members of my generation, it was actually the war in Vietnam that drew me beyond concern into actual involvement. Because even for those of us safe with draft deferments, and if you're watching, you know what I'm talking about, about draft deferments, uh, good, hope you never do. Um, but even though safe with draft deferments, the war was always there, it tugged at us like an undertow. It was always, you could only ignore it by repressing it. 
Each answer our government offered up to the whens, wherefores, and whys of the war seemed to raise two new questions. I've been to that time what I now call a right-wing liberal, what people a lot of times now call liberal war hawks. Uh, it's a species of American political animal that's clearly liberal on domestic policy and clearly conservative on foreign policy. I once referred to it as uh, hooray for justice, beauty, truth, and kill commies. Um, but increasing alienation was the word. Uh, the word dragged on, admitted pre repeated promises that it really was already over. Um, Plus, mounting evidence of what the governments we support in South Vietnam were really like eventually prompted me to very shyly uh, go to a, a peace movement meeting. That was, if I think, in the fall of 1968, if memory serves. That said, I'm not going to inflict my whole autobiography on you, but the thing is, knowing the roots of my involvement in the movement may help to explain where I've wound up. I am, as I say on my blog, I'm an aging hippie, an educator, and a political activist. The circumstances and my mood of the moment determining what order those get said in. I'm also a democratic socialist green with an anarchist bent, a civil liberties absolutist, and someone who has, by both logical conviction and moral compulsion, a commitment to active nonviolence. The only isms I wholeheartedly endorse are eclecticism and skepticism. And uh, in another context, I describe myself as a socialist, anarchist, communalist, capitalist, eclecticist, iconoclast. Uh, I am guided in things I do by four, for lack of a term, editorial principles. One, to thine own self be true, which I'm pretty sure comes from Shakespeare. Two, the U.S. isn't the worst, but it is the biggest. That's from Joan Baez. Three, sometimes a bit of humor contains more inner truth than the most serious seriousness. That was a chess grandmaster named Aaron Nimsevich. And finally, no one but no one, no matter their status as left or right, revolutionary or counter-revolutionary, no matter their ideology or political perspective, can be by that reason alone exempt from either criticism or praise. And that is from me. I've always believed that any political movement has things it can contribute. My skill is words. So figure this is just some way I think I can contribute to the motion, to the move for um, justice. And I will tell you, this is public access TV. You can get involved. You come on down here, they'll help you with it. And don't forget our open house, June 16th, noon to six, down here at the studio. Come on down and we will see you next week. Year two is on its way. <laughs>